I am standing across the street from Nicole Brown Simpson's former home where Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were murdered on June 12th, 1994, around 10 p.m. Now since 1994, this whole front end has been remodeled and there has been an address change. But if you look straight ahead right here, that is where Nicole Brown Simpson's gate used to be, right where this tree is. You can tell through these photos how the tree lines up, how this pole here lines up on the edge of the photo. And on the bottom, you can see this cement box. Just a little after midnight, that's where Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were found dead. This right here is a new entrance to 879 South Bundy Drive in, in Brentwood, California. Now the purpose of this video is to uh, talk about the lead up to the murders, but then the second half will be talking about the heroes that help find the murders. So we're gonna be bouncing back and forth between live and Google satellite just to get a full picture of this. And there's going to be seven locations that we're really gonna be looking at throughout this video. But the first uh, set of, of locations, we're just going to be looking at four of them just to start out with. And then we will cover the next three uh, later on in this video. So we're gonna be starting out with our first location here which is the scene of the murders, which is Nicole Brown Simpson's house on 879 South Bundy Drive. And now the next spot is Ron Goldman's apartment, and that is at 11663 Gorman Avenue in Brentwood. The next address that we're gonna be looking at is the Mezzaluna restaurant where Ron Goldman worked, and that address is 11752 San Vicente Boulevard. And the actual first place that we're going to be looking at on our uh, first four locations is the Paul Revere Middle School. And that is 1450 Allen Ford Avenue. Now the Paul Revere Middle School is about the only thing that's somewhat uh, farther than the other places. But as you can see, Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson lived fairly close to each other. So we're gonna start this by going back to June 12th, 1994 at Paul Revere Middle School. And this was the day of Sydney's, uh, Nicole Brown Simpson's daughter and OJ's daughter. This was the day of her dance recital. And that was held at the Paul Revere School, which I'm standing across the street from right now. And the recital started around 4.40 p.m. That was an exciting day for Sydney and for Nicole as well. She really wanted this to be a special day for Sydney. So she bought gifts and flowers from various different shops in Brentwood. Now we have to mention that Sydney was eight years old, so uh, guaranteed this was very exciting for her. Now I believe right there would be the auditorium where the dance recital would happen. Now, OJ did show up and he sat behind Nicole and her family. Now, most people that were there, uh, Nicole's family, felt the tension between OJ and Nicole. And Nicole largely ignored OJ that night. And this would be the last time the whole family would be under the same roof. 
we all know that Nicole Brown Simpson was married to OJ Simpson for many years. I believe it was seven years. It, it was a, a very abusive relationship, meaning that OJ was very physically abusive to Nicole Brown Simpson. And it also must be noted that, uh, you know, OJ and Nicole had two kids together, Justin and Sydney. And in 1992, Nicole got a divorce from OJ. After their divorce, OJ continuously tried to uh, control Nicole's life. Uh, very jealous. He was very angry. He uh, was stalking her oftentimes because uh, of the jealousy and always wanted to see who she was dating, if she was dating somebody. And he actually one time got into a very big fight with Nicole. So the, uh, the physical abuse uh, continued. It was between 6.30 and 6.40 p.m. on the night of the murders that Nicole Brown Simpson, her daughter Nicole, her son Justin, her mom and several other family members came here. This used to be the Mezzaluna restaurant. They were here to continue the celebration of Sydney's dance recital. But also it must be noted that OJ was not at this dinner party and in fact he wasn't invited. Now Ron Goldman was working that night as a waiter but because Nicole was such a good friend and they were pretty close friends actually he felt a little weird waiting on the family. So that night he actually asked one of the other waitresses that night if he could take over the table of Nicole's party. It was around 8 p.m. when the dinner party was wrapping up. They all said their goodbyes and went their own ways. And unknown to her mother, she left her glasses behind. Nicole got home from the restaurant it was around 9.42 p.m. when Nicole Brown Simpson received a call from her mother telling her that she thinks she left her glasses at the Mezzaluna. Nicole called the restaurant immediately after she got off the phone with her mother. When she called the restaurant, they said they already found the glasses and that Ron Goldman her good friend would swing by after he was done working to drop off the glasses. Now right here at 11663 Gorman, this is Ron Goldman's apartment. And it is said that he came back here before he took the glasses over to Nicole. He came back here to uh, take a shower and change. And then from here, he borrowed a good friend's neighbor's car and headed over to Nicole's. Now, this is literally four to five minutes, just a few minutes away from the restaurant. And from here, driving back to Nicole's is probably another, I don't know, four or five minutes, tack on maybe six or seven if there was traffic, but it's kind of late, so I doubt there was that much traffic. Anyway, this is from where he left. Little that Ron knew, this was his last hour. Now it's believed that Ron Goldman got to Nicole's house right around 10 o'clock. Now this is starting at Ron Goldman's apartment. I'm going to drive the drive that he most likely would have taken because Gorman, if you just go straight, 
it kind of turns into South Bundy Drive. But uh, let's go. Ron Goldman was a waiter at the Mezzaluna restaurant, but he was also an inspiring actor. It was known that Ron Goldman only knew Nicole Brown Simpson at this point for only a few months. During my research, I've noticed that some articles claim that Nicole and Ron had a stronger relationship than just friends. Ron Goldman was only 25 years old. So here we are now at uh, Nicole Brown Simpson's house, and that literally took two, maybe three minutes. So before we go on, let's get a better understanding of Nicole Brown Simpson's condominium. There's two condos here. They're separated in the middle. Now, as we look at it from Google Satellite, Nicole Brown Simpson's condo is on the left side. The front of the condo is on Bundy Drive right here. And the back is in the alley. That's the side where they park the cars. They got the car garages and a back entrance. The back gate is where the totally not OJ murderer went through and left the scene, leaving the exact blood type of OJ on the gate and a few drops around the sidewalk. The front here is where the gruesome murders happened. Now it was sometime between 10 and 10.30 that the murders took place. And this is just through different witnesses throughout the night. Well, that was the first four locations. Let's go on to the next three. The next three is an alley right by Nicole's condo. The other is an apartment, 11970 Montana Avenue, and the corner of South Bundy Drive and Dorothy Street. Let's start off with the alley right by Nicole's condo. A man by the name of Robert Heidstra testified in court that he was walking his dog down South Bundy Drive right around 10 o'clock, just a little before 10 o'clock. And he said that he heard a dog off in the distance that sounded not, it sounded angry and distraught. So, from here, because he was fearful for him and his dog, and to avoid danger, he turned around, walked back this way. Him and his dog took a detour down this alley right here. Now this alley right here parallels with South Bundy Drive and just on the other side of all this foliage and other homes, just right about over here is Nicole Brown Simpson's house. It was about two thirds away through the alley that Heidstra said that he heard a man with a deep voice screaming, yelling, hey, hey, hey. And he said, sounded a lot like OJ Simpson. Now, as we come to the end over here of the alley, this is Dorothy Street. And he said, from there, he, after hearing that, he turned left on Dorothy Street. Now that all happened roughly around or a little after 10 p.m. As he was walking down Dorothy Street, he stopped here to let his dogs sniff around and do their business. He said that he looked this way. That's South Bundy Drive. Just down there is the alley. Uh, behind Nicole Brown Simpson's house. He said that he saw a white car speed through the alley, turn here on South Bundy, and speed off going left on South Bundy Drive. Said the car was white. Now it was largely 
believed that the dog that he heard was Nicole Brown Simpson's Akita. As this chain of events unfolds, you will find that Nicole Brown Simpson's dog, we find out that this dog plays a huge part in this. So the next spot we need to go to is the corner of South Bundy Drive and Dorothy Street. Now there was another man by the name of Steve Swab who uh, testified in court that he was walking his dog on the night of the murders around 11.15 p.m. walking down Dorothy Street heading towards South Bundy Drive. And as he was walking down this way, walking his dog, he said it was right about here when he saw a white dog. Now, he said that the dog looked very distraught and worried and scared. From there, Schwab said that he didn't really know what to do with the dog, so he just walked by the dog and continued walking his own dog, going down South Bundy Drive back to his apartment. However, the dog, the white dog that he saw, started following him. Now, it was right here on Montana where Schwab took a right to go home as the white dog continued following him. Now, literally three minutes walking distance from Nicole's house is where Schwab lived. And this is not the same apartment from 1994. It has been since um, torn down and rebuilt. But... There used to be a pool yard, and this is where the dog followed Schwab all the way back to this apartment. Now this brings us to the apartment 11970 Montana Avenue, and this is the apartment that Steve Schwab lived at at the time. And why I bring up the pool is because that's where he uh, was sitting with the dog that followed him home. Now, Schwab did not want the dog in his house for several reasons. He found blood on its paws. Um, his wife wasn't really excited about the dog being inside the apartment, and his dog as well was not very excited about the dog being in the apartment. So he sat by the poolside with this dog Now another man that testified in court by the name of Sucra Bostepe came home to his apartment. He lived here as well, but he was also a good friend of Schwab's. He came home around 11.40 p.m. the night of the murders. Saw Schwab sitting at the poolside with this white dog and had a conversation with him about it. Bostepe agreed to take the dog for the night and tomorrow morning they would worry about what to do with the dog. Now unfortunately for Sakura Bostepe and his wife who were trying to go to sleep that dog that they brought into the apartment was not comfortable in there. In fact it was whining and crying and scratching at the door to get out. That was just right before midnight when the Bostepes decided to take the dog for a walk. They leashed it up, they got out on the street, and they started walking. Now the dog had a purpose. The dog had a path that it was leading him. It was pulling the Bostepe towards a direction. And they just let the dog Take him where the dog was taken. Now this is where we head back to South Bundy Drive. I'm walking on South Bundy Drive. And the dog, like I said, it's about, I don't know, three to five minutes, depending on how fast you walk. But uh, the dog led him down this way. And that down here at the end, at the corner of South Bundy Drive and Dorothy Street. It's right around where the Cole Brown Simpsons house is. Now it was here where the Bose Tepes were led to by the dog. 
by Nicole Brown Simpson's dog. And it was right here, just around midnight. So when they discovered the double murder of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. It was at that moment when the Bostepes crossed the street to several different houses. The first few houses were unsuccessful, but they went, knocked, ring doorbells. Nobody was coming to a few of them until they found the house that someone would answer the door. They called the police. And it was between 12.05 and 12.10 that the police arrived. Now I think the unfolding of the finding of the bodies, the dead bodies, was pretty amazing. Now, I don't mean it as amazing as a good thing, but the unfolding of the story itself is just so interesting. Now this is OJ Simpson's former home right here. Um, and this is uh, not the original house anymore. Apparently that house that OJ was in since has been torn down. But the night of the murders, uh, police came out here to inform OJ of the murders and he wasn't here. So he wasn't home, and um, the police noticed his Bronco parked out on the road, and that Bronco had sp like sp speckles and splats of blood, and they noticed that there was some blood on the inside by looking into the car. This is also where they found one of the gloves that matches the other glove that they found on Nicole Brown Simpson's house. Both of those had the blood of all three of them. Nicole Brown Simpson, Ron Goldman, and OJ. Now this is gonna be the last physical address that I visit today. Behind here is all of OJ's uh, former home. And the reason why I'm walking over here right now is because you saw the opening over there. That's the main gate now. Well, when OJ owned this house, there was another entrance right here. Like I said, it's all been, um, it's all been remodeled. The house has been torn down. And so, yeah, this is where, where the other entrance was right here. And I'm not sure exactly where, but his Bronco, his white Bronco, his famous Bronco, um, is parked out here somewhere. And that's where they found the blood splattered. And then he instantly became one of the um, top suspects. Just one last thing I want to say is I drove directly from Nicole's house to out here and it's roughly about eight to 10 minutes, give or take, to get here. So if, if OJ did it, it would only take him about eight to 10 minutes to get back to his house. Thank you.